had this weekend set up the whole sanctuary as the, the journey to the cross, we started with the uh, communion, uh, or the Last Supper, I should say, uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the cross and the nails and, and the, what he, the pain he went through. And then uh, as people came over the, the, uh, the days, as we started Wednesday afternoon, we've had like over 400 people come over uh, and experience this. They nail prayers to their cross. And, and you have the, the, the uh, temple whose veil was torn from top to bottom uh, the tomb in the back, and then the bitter room is on the last room, which is the upper room. And, and that's what I want to talk to you this morning. We will have that open this morning, after, I mean, this afternoon at 1 o'clock again, from 1 to 4, if you want to experience that. Uh, because I think Easter is not just about the resurrection. Easter is, if Paul said it this way, and let me just quote it to you so that you can just think about it. When Paul starts writing to the church at Corinth, he said to them, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried but he was raised from the third day according to the scriptures and he appeared to Cephas or Peter and his 12 disciples and many others close to 500 for a period of 40 days. I want you to think about this because if you look at it on our, the way we live today, if you hung out with Jesus for three years, I mean, you, you ate with him, you, you slept with him, you walked with him, you saw him heal the sick, you saw him do all this stuff. And then you see him go through the gruesome pain of the cross, and then when he's expected, when he dies, on the third day he wakes up from the grave, he gets up. But, but he didn't get out of that cross and was resurrected just so that you and I would have an Easter Sunday. He gets out of that grave. I want you to think about it. If this happened to you, if, if I'll just pick on Joe and, and Erica if I can for a second. Can you imagine if, no, I better not. I'll pick on Angie. That'd be a better memory. <laughs> but can you imagine if, if she sees me die and go through the cross and the pain, and on the third day, I wake up and I come and see her. Hey, how are you? And let's just say she happens to be Thomas. And I say, hey, Thomas, why don't you touch the side? Because you didn't believe I went through this. And Thomas puts his hands. I would assure most of us would be in trauma counseling. I promise you. In our culture today, how many of you know you would have some counseling you had to do? I know she would. Can you imagine if I'm visiting her for 40 days? She's like, are you alive? Are you dead? What's going on? But it's not about that. It's about what he does. Because he's raised as a king like no other king. And he wants his disciples to truly understand that it was not just about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It is about something else. If you would, go with me to the book of Romans chapter 5. I think that we miss the wonder of Easter sometimes because we lose the wonder of the power of God. I was utterly amazed that God would die for someone he did not know. And this is where the scripture makes a strong reference. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 7, if you would. One will hardly die for a righteous man. 
Though perhaps for the good men, someone would dare even to die. Let me ask you a question. It would be as if you know someone might be in death row and, and, and he committed a crime and he's going to be punished and he's going to die. And I make an altar call. Who volunteers to go give his life for that person? Don't all get up at the same time. That's exactly what he did. He, you know, we would probably die for a husband, for a wife, for a child, for a grandchild. Would you agree? But Jesus dies for people that hate him, that are enemies. I can remember my days before Christ. I, I will tell you honestly, I still remember, maybe I need to go through Zozo or counseling or something. Uh, mocking Christians who would carry their Bibles. And I would say, look at these evangelicals. They're crazy. Look at me now. I'm just as crazy as they were. But God has the ability through the resurrection to touch someone that considers themselves enemies. And I love what it says here because look at the next verse. Verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10, for while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The picture you get, it's not the experience. You know, I came from an, uh, any ex-Catholics or Catholics here? Oh, wow, you're in good company. I, I was just as lost as you could be. And, uh, you know, when I first heard about Nathan presented the idea of doing the stations of the cross, I mean of the, uh, uh, the journey to the cross, I'm going to tell you what popped into my head. My experience in the past, which was not a good one. You pray to all these saints and all this stuff and, you know, it, no, I don't mean to offend anybody, but, you know, it was kind of kind of creepy, to be honest with you. But, but I, going through this whole thing for two years now, it revives the memory of what Easter is all about. He prepared his disciples a week by spending and doing the Last Supper which was a picture that started all the way in Egypt when they had the Passover and they were delivered out of the land of Egypt and, and transferred into the desert that was a place of utter death. But in the place of death, God sustains them for 40 years. Can you imagine? The Bible says that at night there was a pillar of fire. During the day... There was a cloud that covered them. When they got hungry, they, they rained manna. That's pretty good service. Would you agree? So here's the picture all the way from the Old Testament. And Jesus is now putting everything together that they've seen and studied all the years. This is where science, I'm telling you, archaeology and history is crashing into the kingdom of God. Because there's no way you can have 66 books in the Bible written at different times by different writers synchronize so much information about the one and only God who redeems mankind. There's just no way. It's not an accident. Which tells me you are not an accident. You were thought of. You were created by God himself. Why? 
Why would Jesus do something crazy to die for an enemy? You know, in the old days, it was an eye for an eye. Well, let's put it in today's day. You hurt me. I hurt you. Someone said it. I didn't. That's the culture we live in, and yet Jesus teaches us a total different way. And he says, look, I'm going to die for the ones that hate me. And he does that so that you and I would recover the wonder in the power that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. You are not an accident. You might have been told you were not planned. You were not intended. You might, you're might you not this. You're not that. You don't match this. I don't care what the voices of the enemy have ever said to you. By the way, you did not come from a monkey. I'm telling you. Have you ever asked yourself this question? If we came from a monkey, why didn't the rest of the monkeys become men? There's still plenty of monkeys. Would you agree? What happened to them? No, you're not. God knew that you needed a resurrected king. Look at verse 17. Because this is why we celebrate Easter today. This is why we recover the wonder that he is like no other king because he died for people that really did not deserve it and he died for this specific purpose verse 17 of romans 5 for if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness are going to reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. He, he, he comes to a place, he celebrates Passover, he goes through the suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, he goes through the suffering of the cross, God toy, tears the veil, he, he, he rises from the tomb, in 40 days he hangs out with people that are probably scared to death to see a man living that is dead, that was friend, that now is alive. Can you imagine? But they are catching glimpses of what their call and their destiny is going to be all about. Because in that process, they're going to learn that they see a resurrected Christ so that they can reign in life through Jesus Christ. In other words, the song that I wanted to sing, there ain't no grave that's going to hold my body down, is true yesterday, today, and it will be tomorrow again. Because he did something through the power of the resurrection. And you may ask yourself, think about this. For 40 days, the Bible says he appeared to, to, to over 500 people. But only 120 appeared in the upper room. That means there was 380 people that were missing in action. Would you agree? Where were they? Maybe they were in counseling with trauma. I don't know where they were. But I'm glad the 120 were in the upper room because Jesus appears to them. Now, can you imagine? This is, this is what you and I would call today a ghost. Would you agree? So can someone talk to me in English today? I know it's Easter, but just work with me for just a second. If I appeared, and by the way, Jesus is the only one that did it. So if somebody's appearing to you, you you do need to come and talk to me, would you? But wouldn't it be crazy? I mean, I don't know what Angie would say if I'm visiting her for 40 days and She's probably like, but he appears for one purpose. And he says to them, look, I am alive. I've come from one single purpose. 
to give you the promise of the Father. Because the Father desires that through my resurrection, He will clothe you with power to live life reigning and not defeated. And so, in Acts chapter 1, if you would go with me to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 1, he simply disappears. That would be another social counseling session. Can you imagine? He's talking to them and suddenly they see the, the heavens open, angels. And he just... How many of you watched Star Trek and, and you so beam me up, Scotty? He just... He, he just he goes. What do you think these disciples are thinking? What would you be thinking? I'd be like, what did I get into? In fact, I will tell you, when I gave my life to Jesus, I thought I was good. No, no, I was horrible. I know I, I needed a savior. I, 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 was, I was a wicked man. I was involved in, I mean, I was involved in everything you can be involved. And the crazy thing is, I was so addicted to stuff that, that I, I knew I had to stop this stuff. It was killing me. I just couldn't stop it. And this one man got up one day, started preaching the gospel to me, and I thought, God. Now, remember, I, my, my, my paradigm here is like, oh, he's, yeah, he's alive, but you, you know, talk to this one, talk to that one. It, it was real confusing. But I, say, I remember saying, 1978, I said, if you really are for real, you need to save me and deliver me because I am a mess. And I will tell you, I don't know what happened. I've talked to Pablo about this. But from one day to the other, I never once touched any of my addictions. Ever. I couldn't even understand it. I would go to my friends and say, you want, you want, a, you want a touch of this? I would tell them, no, I'm so happy. I probably thought, can you give me some of what you have? <laughs> and I did. I, one day, my brother came to me and he said, here, I, I, I got all this Coke for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I said, look, if you give it to me, I'll go flush it down the toilet because I don't need it anymore. I am set free. He got so convicted. He thought, this is crazy what has happened to him. He, he, he told me, because he ended up getting saved uh, six months or a year later, uh, and he said, I saw like a, a, a something in your face, like a radiance or something scared me. And I'm going to tell you, don't, don't discount people's journey. Because I remember, we, now we remember, we were Catholic, so we had this Bible that is as big as... Does anybody identify with any of this stuff? I mean, I had a Bible. That thing was big. It was like bi this big. And I remember my brother was so convicted that he would get, I mean, I'll let you tell his story. He'd get so toasted and go read the Bible. And I'm like, how are you going to understand this thing? He said, I don't know, but man, I don't have a any idea what this thing says oh but his day came and that word that's written there became alive to him and the day this happened to him this dude used to sm smoke two packs of cigarettes a day a day a day he gave his life to Jesus Scared him half to death because he saw a big light come into his room. Because he thought I was crazy. So he's praying. He's, I don't know what he's praying. 
He's just as lost as they can be. And he said, if you're real, if this really happened, save me and take this stuff away. The next day, he never touched a cigarette ever again. It's 35 years now, he's never touched a cigarette. There is power and redemption in this story. And Jesus appears for 40 days to his disciples and his people to tell them, look, I'm resurrected. I'm alive. I'm not leaving you helpless. I'm not leaving you as orphans. I am giving you the promise of the Father so that you are alive. You are awake to this world that no one can see. I I love this story. Would you go with me to the book of Acts? I'm sorry if I'm a little bit too excited, but it's Easter. And I think there ain't no grave that's going to hold my body down. I know that's bad English, isn't it? We need to talk to the writer. I, I was, Angie was telling me who wrote that song, and I'm like, are you serious? Just be encouraged. God spoke to a prophet through a donkey. But look at Acts chapter 4, because here's how the story starts. These disciples have had an encounter with what you and I would call a ghost. Jesus, he's alive. They are now in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes on them. And you know the crazy thing is they all started speaking in tongues. Now, I'm going to tell you. How many of you came to the charismatic movement from, from Catholic to the charismatic movement? I will tell you, it was, it, was a, it was an experience for me. I didn't know what was happening. In those days, they would pull the chair, sit you down. Some of you may identify with this. Tell me if you do. And uh, they would surround you. And you're thinking, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? He said, no, we're going to pray for you. We're going to tarry. Now, remember, I don't know any of this stuff that happens in charismatic church. I, I didn't know any. This is like weird to me. They sit me down. They lay hands on me. They start praying over me. And I'm like, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. But you know, you, you, you want, you're hungry. You want this. But I wanted it so bad that I, I, I was like forcing it. And here's what happened. God filled me with his presence. But it was so that you and I could experience the promise of living a life of victory on earth. And so this is where Peter and John start their journey. They just came out of the upper room. These two have always been in competition. Peter and John, I mean, you can read the writings of the gospel. They were always competing about everything. They happen to go to the temple. And they go to the temple and there's a beggar at the entrance of the temple. And and he says to them, hey, do you have any money? And Peter and John says this, silver and gold, we really don't have. But what we have, we're going to give to you. Now think of the experience of this beggar. They said to him, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. The man gets up, walks into the temple, probably screaming of the joy of being healed. The next day, these disciples are in trouble because they've done something that's never been done. And they're telling them, how could you do this? Whose name, what power do you have? Look at at Acts chapter 4, if if you would, verse um, 33. Well, let's do verse 10 real quick. Let it be known to all of you 
and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified. Wait a minute. I thought you just betrayed him about five days ago. Can I tell you what happened to him? Here's what happened to him. He realized that all of his sins, all of his bad stuff was written, all the debt. Colossians says it this way, the certificate of debt that was against us was nailed to the cross. And Peter realizes that now the stuff that he has done in the past does not matter anymore. Amen. He has become a new creature. Everything has been wiped away. And now he's telling the rest of the Jews, you crucified him. I had nothing to do with it. Why would he say such a thing? Because he has found the power of redemption. I, was, I had this sweetest story. I had a, a grandma come through this uh, uh, journey. She, she brought her grandson and the little guy. And he came and, you know, they were praying through all the stations. He comes and starts nailing his prayer request, or I don't know what, what he nailed. But uh, he goes home and daddy asks him, what did you write on that cross? He said, Dad, that's between God and me. Out of the mouth of babes. So here's these people now proclaiming that there's a name that has been compounded in every other name. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah, Je Jehovah Rapha, all the names of God that they've heard is now compounded into one name. And this is what it says. Whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. Verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The disciples got a grasp of the reality of the power of the name of Jesus. In this Easter, we need to think about and be gracious and thankful for the experience that Easter represents, but Easter also carries the assignment of you and I being the witnesses on the face of the earth. And in verse 33 of that same chapter, look what happened to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon all of them. I love their journey. Look, look at chapter 5, verse 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number to such extent that they were even carried the sick out into the streets laid them upon cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least the shadow might fall on any one of them. And all the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick, afflicted, with unclean spirits, and they were all being, someone help me, healed. The revival they experience because of the wonder of the resurrection. Can you imagine if we this morning would grasp the power of the resurrection and what Easter really, really means? Would love to see city of Houston bringing people that are sick and getting them all healed and set free. I, I am, my prayer is, God, would you pour out your spirit once again Hallelujah. upon us so that we may touch a city, a nation, a world.
that's in need of a visitation of God. Would you agree with that? I, I you know, I, I was very judgmental in, in my earlier years, very critical of everything. I know none of you were there, but I was. And I look at the wonder of what's happening today all over the world, good or bad. People stop to celebrate Easter in Europe, in South America, all over the place. I look at what happened in France, the tragedy. And some, one, one, one commentary said, I hope they don't build it without the spirit that was in that place. I've never been to, to Not Notre Dame, but I, I just wonder if God's trying to wake up our, our hearts to say, hey, move on. This is a battlefield. Because I believe it is. I, I look at some of the stories of friends that I have that you and I fund in the mission field that are in China right now. They're, they're on the risk of being arrested. And you know, if they arrest you there, you're not coming up. What's driving them to do crazy stuff? They have a cause. They have a desire to see God move upon people that need Jesus. That's the power of Easter for me. And I'm saying to all of us, recover the wonder of the cross of the death, of the resurrection. Recover the wonder of the power of the Holy Spirit. Go to your jobs. Bring the kingdom there. Go to your homes. Go to your families. Go to your kids. Pray for them. Lay hands on them. They're not walking with God. Anoint their rooms. I remember my, my wife every single day she homeschooled for many years, and she would go in. My kids thought she was crazy. They don't think she's that crazy anymore, but she would anoint her rooms with oil, the, the doorposts, her, their pillows. One time they asked, why are these pillows so oily? And she said, I, I don't know. Oh, the power of a pray mama. Thank God someone's praying for us. Listen, your kids, I don't care what facet of the journey they're in, they are the future of the United States, whether you like it or not, and we better pray and, and fight for them and invest in them and say, God, if you could rescue someone like this one, this one was bad. If you could rescue someone like me, God, you can rescue this generation. Instead of being so critical about them, let me just close with this. Go with me to Revelation 19. Because this book, the whole culmination of the Bible, closes with a book called Revelation. In this book... If you read verse 1, chapter 1, and verse 2, I know I might offend some of you, but I, you're going to forgive me because it's Easter, right? This book is all about the revelation of Jesus Christ on the face of the earth. Verse 1 says it this way, the revelation of Jesus Christ that he gave to his disciples by symbols and signs. He's revealing the Christ in the midst of conflict. And if you're facing a conflict, God's telling you, there is no other king like me that can rescue and bring freedom into the conflict you are facing today. Yes, they were persecuted. Yes, there was 144,000. Yes, but they came out victorious. Yes, but I saw the serpent. Yeah, but I also saw the Christ. Yes, but I saw the beast. Yeah, but I saw the king of kings. 
Yeah, but, but I saw them going through trials. Yeah, they did. But in all these trials, they overcame. Well, but I saw Babylon. I saw the woman that sits on many waters. Oh, Revelation 19 tells you the four hallelujahs in, in chapter 19 of Revelation is the rejoicing that she's been judged, the one who deceived the world, the one who deceived the saints. She's judged. And now it opens with another great supper like the one Jesus had. And it's called the Supper of the Lamb. And I won't read it, but it goes like this. And I saw those whose garments were clean and righteous for their... uh, uh, Garments are white because of the righteous deeds of the saints. And I saw them eat at the table with the Lamb. And now look how the king comes out. Back onto the earth. I don't think he's coming out with any stress. Any signs of defeat. This is what it says in verse 11. And I saw heaven open. God open your heavens. And behold a white horse. And he who sat upon it. Is called faithful and true. In righteous and in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Don't forget, he is your king, and he is waging war against every one of your adversaries. I love verse 12. And his eyes are a flame of fire. Upon his head are many diadems, and he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. And then look at verse 16. I love this. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. Someone help me. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I think he's coming out to conquer every one of your adversaries. And I believe the wonder of you and I recovering Easter is God, would you anoint us and clothe us with the same power you clothe these 12 disciples of yours in the 120? I love the description of the 12 because the Bible speaks of them. In Acts chapter 3, they were unlearned men. I love it. They put him before the courts of the most, the, the smartest religious people. And they said, well, these, these are just unlearned men. But we recognize they've been with Jesus. And my prayer is, God, may people recognize that we have been with you. And with this same power, they witness upon the face of the earth. By the time you get to chapter 20 of the book of Acts, all Asia had heard of the name of Jesus. No internet, no satellite, but the power was manifest. Church, I invite you this morning. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm telling you, this is my own testimony. I was minding my own business, having a good time. But at the right time, this guy spoke about Jesus, and he made it a challenge. He said, if you you dare to believe this Jesus, he's going to do a miracle for you today. I'm like, I know one that I need right now. But he said, you got to surrender your life. You got to surrender everything. And I did. And my life has never been the same. And my prayer is that if you've been walking with God for one year, two years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, don't lose the wonder of this season. Make this Easter an unforgettable Easter. Celebrate the power of the cross and realize 
that I don't care what sins are against you, what debts are against you, they were nailed on the cross 2,000 years ago so that you and I could reign in life the way Adam and Eve reigned in the Garden of Eden before they committed sin. Easter to us, and the reason we do this is because, you know, I got convicted last year and this year because I looked at this like, what is this going to do? And I'll tell you what it did for me. It revived the reality of all the stuff that God has done for me that I sometimes take for granted because busy life, busy times, things to do, raising kids, raising family, doing work, sometimes gets your heart away from the real things. And I'm telling you, he is coming back for a church and a bride that is brilliant, full of wonder, and waiting for the King of Kings to be made manifest. Would you stand with me today? I don't know where you are with the Lord, but I just feel that as we sing this uh, song here in just a moment, you know, don't be afraid of death. This is the way I picture death. I know that the moment I close my eyes and, and, and I leave this body, oh, the first set of eyes that I will see is the face of the Savior that I've loved all my life since I gave him my heart. And my prayer is that he says, Fernando, you were a good and faithful servant. Enter into that rest that I've provided for you.